Hi, everyone. I'm here with Know Your Brain, Aphasia and Cognition. Um, I'm here with Julia as well. She's my tech support and will <laughs> fill in some more of the details. Um, we're teaming up to give you guys some more information on knowing your brain in terms of your language processing and your cognition. Um, now, this is all part of a series of presentations we're giving, um, the Stroke Education series. So if you haven't watched Sam's video from two weeks ago, um, definitely look that one up. It's going to be give you some more overview picture of the brain um, and won't go quite into as much detail as we are in here. To start with, we're going to kind of talk about a couple of the things that could happen after a stroke. Um, now, everyone knows there's a lot of different parts in your brain. Each part has kind of a primary different role. That being said, they're all connected. So this slide is just to kind of show you some of the different impairments or um, functions that can be affected after you have a stroke, depending on whether it's on the left side or the right side. So we're going to start with over here on the left side. Um, now, I'm going to give you some of this information, and there's going to be a lot of detail in here. You don't have to worry about knowing every single thing about these, but, you know, try to look at yourself and see if this is something, if there's anything that seems familiar to you. That insight is really important. So we'll start with aphasia up at the top on the left side. Aphasia is when the brain cannot access the networks of words it needs to understand or to say um, in order to communicate. Um, it may be unable to communicate wants, needs, or ideas. And then over here, we've got Alexia. This is often paired with aphasia, but does have its own name and it's the when the brain cannot process letters and decode them into words. Um, some may recognize individual letters but cannot put them together into words. It primarily affects your reading. Then we've got dyscalculia. The brain cannot process numbers or might confuse numbers. A lot of times people with Aphasia will say numbers are particularly difficult for them. Well, that number sense is also housed in the left side of your brain. Then there's apraxia. Apraxia, we're going to call this more apraxia of speech since I'm a speech language pathologist. Um, but apraxia of speech is when the brain cannot send accurate messages to the muscles of the mouth to initiate sequences of speech sounds. Generally, the longer the sequence, or the longer the word, the harder it is. Um, then we've got agnosia, which is the brain has a difficulty or an inability to recognize and identify objects or people. People with agnosia may have difficulty recognizing features of an object or faces um, but they know what the object is used for or whether a face is familiar or not. Um, an example might be using a comb. Um, they'll have a difficulty time recognizing that it is a comb, um, but, and they'll also have a difficult time knowing what they'd use it for. All right. Now, moving on to the left, to the right side over here. Our first one is left neglect. Now, this kind of goes back to Sam's presentation that many of the features of the brain cross. So, when you have your right side of your brain is primarily in charge of the left side of your body. Because of that, 
left neglect is actually a right hemisphere disorder. Um, and it's when the brain has difficulty paying attention to stimuli on the left side. Then we've got insight, which is the brain has decreased ability to be self-aware. As a result, they will have difficulty recognizing their impairments or deficits as a result of their brain injury. We've got inhibition um, or impulsive. The brain is more likely not to plan in advance. And then it's, we also have music and symbols. So with music, it might be harder for you to perceive a melody and with symbols, abstract symbols or nonverbal gestures may be more difficult for the brain to decode. All right, now let's get into some more specifics, which is aphasia. Um, the slide before gave a nice overview of some of the major um, symptoms we might see with localized sections for the brain. Um, but now we're going to talk about one of the major symptoms, which is aphasia, which can cause difficulty speaking, understanding, reading, and writing. Um, the language loop is in the left hemisphere in about 95% of right-handed people and 70% of left-handed people. Um, this language loop includes Wernicke's area, the arcuate fasciculus, and Broca's area. Each of these plays an important role in the communication and language. Um, Wernicke's area is usually where you receive all of the stimuli so that you can understand what someone is saying to you. And then it is sent along the arcuate fasciculus um, as kind of a pathway so that it can communicate with Broca's area where you primarily put together all that information to make it into a sequence for you to say. Um, if we look at each of these areas, let's start with Wernicke's area. It's down here in the temporal lobe. It's in charge primarily of understanding. And also in this area, general area, is reading. Um, now, when we say reading, it's primarily reading comprehension. Next, we've got Broca's area, which is down in the frontal lobe up here. It's in charge primarily of fluency, so being able to say words in a connected sequence, and also writing, um, being able to spell words, being able to write them out um, and write out full sentences that are grammatically correct. And then we've got the arcuate fasciculus. Um, it connects Wernicke's area, understanding, to Broca's area for speaking. Um, what we see primarily when a stroke affects just the arcuate fasciculus is there's a problem with repetition. So if someone says something to you, you have a really hard time repeating it back to them. It's not often that just the arcuate fasciculus is affected, but it's often combined with some of the different types of aphasia where difficulty speaking and repeating or difficulty understanding and repeating. Um, that, now, I know we've broken up all of these areas very nicely into these different functions, but it's really important to keep in mind the brain is connected. Um, the language loop needs input from all other parts of the brain. So even if you didn't have a stroke in these primary areas, that language center can, and language loop can still be affected. Um, this is a good picture to kind of demonstrate some of this, which is these red arrows indicate input connections. So here we can see that the brain gets input from the visual cortex and it goes to Wernicke's area. It also gets input 
from the primary auditory cortex, so your hearing. Um, and then Wernicke's area sends all of that to Broca's area. Broca's area then can put it together and send it to the motor cortex. This motor cortex is kind of the output. It's what tells your mouth to move and follows the sequence that Broca had kind of designed for you. Another important piece of information to keep in mind, there are multiple types of aphasia, but it is more of a spectrum. Um, down here, I've shown uh, seven different types of aphasia. There is an additional aphasia called anomia, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But to start with, I wanted to just kind of give you guys this overview to show that, you know, in we're going to talk about two of the major ones, and then we're going to transition and kind of see where we want to go. So let's start with Broca's area here. Um, Broca's area, you can see, is in the frontal lobe up here. And the X's indicate in areas where you got, there's an impairment. So in this case, um, if you have Broca's aphasia, you'd have trouble with fluency. So being able to say words in a connected full sentences. Um, and you'd also have trouble repeating. Um, another type kind of on the flip side would be Wernicke's aphasia. Um, whereas in Broca's, you had pretty good comprehension with this check mark. In Wernicke's, you, um, primary deficit is actually in comprehension. You also have trouble repeating, but you're relatively fluent. What this would look like is someone might be able to say a lot of words relatively smoothly, but their words may not be accurate. Meanwhile, Broca's aphasia is more like you've got halting speech with lots of breaks in it. You might only be using keywords instead of complex sentences. Um, then the, the rest, we've got conduction, transcortical motor, transcortical sensory, transcortical mixed, and global. These are all kind of mixes of these three main um, areas of fluency, comprehension, and repetition. Um, you can see over here, we've got global, which kind of knocks out all three of those. But keep in mind that a lot of people will move from one type of aphasia to another type. So just because someone is diagnosed with global initially doesn't mean you will stay at global aphasia. You can work hard and improve each of these areas. And a lot of times this is how we base our therapy is, you know, if you've got Broca's aphasia, we might really try to work on fluency and repetition. Whereas Wernicke's, we might focus more on comprehension and repetition. Um, now, I mentioned anomia in the beginning. Anomia is where all three of these have check marks, but you still have some lingering um, word finding problems that sometimes are more people don't even pick up on. But a lot of times speech is still a little bit more effortful. It's often where we're trying to get people is to anomic aphasia because by that point, they can really be independent in their home exercise to try to get all the way back to baseline. Or if they're satisfied with where they're at, they can communicate relatively easily throughout their life for all their functions. Um, now, a couple of things to keep in mind about aphasia. It does not impact your intelligence. Aphasia is a language disorder. When you have aphasia, it does not make you any less intelligent than you were before. Second point, recovery does not stop after one year. 
is continuous. It can be a lifelong process. Um, you can, you know, everyone's recovery track looks differently. Sometimes people are slow and steady going up. Other people might have jumps, um, but there's no time limit to recovery. And finally, the more communication opportunities, the better. Um, as much as you, the thing that's going to help you the most in improving your language is talking more, communicating more, um, trying to use it in as many situations as you can. Now, I know we didn't talk a whole lot about cognition except for in the beginning. Um, and the primary reason for that is cognition is relatively spread out throughout the brain. Um, but some, if you look back at Sam's presentation, though, you can see like each general lobe has some different functions in terms of memory and attention um, and problem solving. All of those have general locations within the each lobe. Um, but for this presentation, I just wanted to touch a little bit on some things to keep in mind also about cognition, which is, again, recovery does not stop after one year. There's no time limit to recovery. Second, you may have to do things differently at first. Um, all of your cognition and the your routines and the things you did before you developed over your lifetime. Your brain has to relearn and rewire to be able to do those things again. In order to do, do that, you're going to have to do it differently at first. For example, using a planner, writing things down, slowing down are all ways to teach your brain. Um, you want to give it the support for it to learn. All right. Now, this was a lot of information, but I want to show you guys an example also of how you can break down this information for your, either your loved one with a stroke or how you as a patient can break down your information or maybe you're another therapist and you need to summarize this information for someone. So I'm gonna switch over to a Word document now that I've cre created at, for an example patient. All right. Uh, so first off, we've got their diagnosis. Good things to keep in mind about this. We want to make sure that you're, you have these big ideas, that you're breaking down these categories really clearly um, and use key bullet points. Um, oftentimes a good starting place might be to look at your discharge paperwork um, to see what information they give and then pick out what the most important things are. In this case, the big diagnosis was a stroke. Particularly, it was an ischemic stroke. And I wrote a little definition of what that is. A blood clot blocks blood from flowing to the brain. Down here, we've got caused by high blood pressure. You'll notice that you use bigger text and a lot of white space. That makes it a little bit easier to read and to follow. Another good thing to do when you're making these is have some visuals. So down here, I've got this picture of the brain you might have recognized from Sam's presentation. And it's got all of these lobes and cortexes labeled. Um, and within that, it has all the functions in each. This can be a good visual um, so that you don't have to memorize all this neuroanatomy. In blue, I shaded a general location based on the medical documents of where the stroke would be. Now, this is not at all equivalent to an MRI image. It's just to help give an idea that this stroke happened in the frontal lobe in the left hemisphere. As a result, it affected Broca's area and the motor cortex. 
The next page tells more about, okay, now I know what happened, the diagnosis, but what were the results of this stroke? First thing, I have aphasia. And then I give a definition. What is aphasia? A language impairment due to a brain injury. Some things that can affect are speech, understanding, reading, and writing. This person also had right-sided hemiparesis. And the definition, reduced ability to move the right side of your body. It can affect their arm, their leg, their face, or their trunk. It can also affect their ability to walk or grasp items. Um, this next section is kind of an optional section, but I like to kind of go into further detail about language. Um, you could also do the same thing if you're a physical therapist, break down your results for PT or same thing with occupational therapy, break it down. Um, but I'm a speech therapist, so I use language as my example. So I've got my language broken down. And first I kind of give what type of aphasia they had when they came in, which is Broca's aphasia. Um, and a little definition. My brain has difficulty accessing the network of words needed to speak and repeat fluently, but I can understand well. And then we've got speaking was affected moderate to severe. It's one of the weaknesses that they listed. Fluency is moderate, word finding is severe. Comprehension, mild difficulty. They can understand others relatively well, but they may still have difficulty with more complex sentences. We go down here to reading, um, which is actually a strength. So I starred that one twice. Their comprehension is normal out loud. They have mild difficulty, but overall it's a lot more, you see a lot more improvement in reading than in fluency when they're speaking out loud in conversation. Down here, we've got writing, which they had moderate difficulty with. Um, in this case, we're gonna try and use probably these strengths of reading to help this weakness in speaking. So we might have them read out loud a lot more in so that that would help their fluency for speaking. Um, this is just one example, but I would encourage you to make your own version of this worksheet or ask your therapist to make one for you. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that little bit of insight into aphasia and cognition and into your brain. Um, if you guys have any questions, always feel free to email us or give us a call.